Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12063 Advanced Statutory Interpretation and Drafting. We're into week two. First assessment is the mock cabinet submission due on Thursday the 6th of September. I hope by now you have identified an area of law that you think is in need of reform. And I hope that you're starting to formulate your ideas in terms of the type of work that you intend to produce. What you're looking to do is look at uh, some area of practice where you believe the law is unjust, inefficient, ambiguous, or otherwise simply in need of reform. It may be that there is current legislation where you believe the legislation doesn't properly reflect community expectations or doesn't properly reflect the intention or purpose of Parliament in creating the law. Or it may be that you create something entirely fresh for yourself. Please feel free to exchange ideas in um, relation to your thoughts about the type of work that you'll um, undertake in that regard. And I thank uh, those of you who contributed some comments last week about the first assessment. I won't say any more about the first assessment, but if there are any questions, comments, please let me know. And in the meantime, I encourage you to continue to um, share your thoughts on UCRU and the Zoom sessions. Okay, so when we're dealing with statutory interpretation, you'll see a few words and a few cases that come up regularly. We know that as part of our assessment regime, we're required to participate. I wonder if this would be a good way to participate, essentially to create a toolkit for yourself. Now, it may be that you share that information, but you don't have to. Um, participation would suggest sharing, and that's what I encourage, but it may be that you feel um, that you contribute some things through the shared mechanism and something else that you keep as a toolkit just for yourself. Either way is fine, but as you proceed through your studies, through your reading in this advanced course, I'd like you to leave the unit with some clear ideas about statutory interpretation so that you are ready to proceed into practice as it were. Last week, we talked about the need to identify words, meaning and a case or section that relates to that. So let's have a little refresher. In terms of statutory interpretation, you'll often hear concepts um, repeating themselves. We talk about purpose, intention, we talk about objects, and we talk about uh, context. So in relation to all of those words, I want you to start creating a short form of material that you can use in practice that helps you to get to the heart of the matter. So again, last week we, talk, we talked about legislative intent being different to um, purpose or object. And statutory purpose focuses on the why and the who. Statutory intention focuses on the what and the how. So these are things that you can identify and put some context so that it works for you. In other words, when you identify or you see a word, you've got something that you can refer to in your toolkit that you add into your participation work at the end of the um, term to help you better identify what we mean by these things. So for example, if I identify the word purpose, one that you'll see in statutory interpretation and one that you will need to consider, I think carefully in the context of the first assignment, assessment piece, from a Queensland perspective, what is a section of an act that immediately comes to mind when we talk about the purpose of an act. Let's see who's on the ball can come in first. I'm thinking of a particular section of an act. I suspect you'll probably have no trouble in identifying the act. When it comes to talking about the purpose of legislation and interpreting the purpose of an act, what's the section and what's the act? that comes to mind. Section 14. Well, close. 14A is what I had in mind. So the reason I'm suggesting that is that's probably the first place you need to look 
if you're in the process of drafting legislation for your first assessment piece. Now, the section 14A talks about interpretation in the context of best achieving the purpose. So you'll need to know what we mean by purpose. You'll need to contrast that with intent, contrast, uh, intent and, um, con and, and other issues um, such as interpretation. So interpreting the purpose of the legislation is one thing. We need to look at the section. You need to have some cases in mind. Where's a good way to find case law in relation to a particular section? The textbook is one. Where else would you look? There's certainly something that immediately comes to my mind. Note up. Yes, that's what I do. Um, Note up is in Ostley, but you can find similar citators in different platforms. So if you're looking for something in relation to the Act's purpose for your assessment piece, you'll be thinking about Section 14A of the Act's Interpretation Act in the Queensland context. If you're then thinking about case law relevant to it, think about note up. Can anyone tell me um, one or two leading cases that deal with issues to do with purpose? Not necessarily Queensland cases, we'll, we'll broaden this now to the Commonwealth sphere. So see if you're on the ball. There's really one case that always comes to mind in statutory interpretation as I think the leading case. TO is a good one. It's not the one I had in mind. TO is very good in terms of dealing with the way in which laws are interpreted in the context of treaties and international obligations. That's it. Adam's got the one that I've got in mind. Everyone's answering with a question tonight, so it's not <laughs> so it's um, not as quite as convincing as it might be. But Project Blue Sky, I think that's the first case you should always think about. So, what does Project Blue Sky says? Well, it actually identifies a couple of things, and um, it's authority for the basic proposition that the task of a person attempting to interpret legislation is to identify the objective intention of the legislature. So there's some very good quotes and uh, there's one here that um, I'll refer you to in terms of that case. So the High Court said um, in Project Blue Sky at 384, this is McHugh, Gummo, Kirby and Hain. The duty of a court is to give the words of a statutory provision the meaning that the legislature is taken to have intended to give to, to uh, them to have. Ordinarily, that meaning, the legal meaning, will correspond with the grammatical meaning of the provision, but not always. The context of the words, the consequences of a literal or grammatic construction, the purpose of the statute or the canons of construction may require the words of the provision be read in a way that does not correspond with the literal or grammatical meaning. Okay, so I would have that type of quote, not necessarily that one, but I would have that case and perhaps that quote in a little toolkit so that you can refer to it quickly. One of the good things about that quote is it covers a whole range of different aspects that may be relevant when dealing with statutory interpretation principles. There are some others. Um, another one which I think is probably a bit underrated is Singh against the Commonwealth, which is 2004, 222 CLR 322, which talks about meaning in the context, uh, meaning and context. Another is Lacey against the Attorney General, 2011, 242, CLR 573, which talks about the application of rules of interpretation and the in identification of statutory purpose. Um, when we're thinking about Section 14A in the Queensland sphere, we should also think about the Commonwealth counterpart. So what's the counterpart section in the Commonwealth legislation that deals with the requirement to consider purpose? Fifteen AA. Yes, very good. Thank you, Helen. Got it. And no question mark this time. Excellent. Even better. All right. So these are the important provisions. But it is important that you create, I think, some sort of flowchart
as well as having the definitions, the sections and the cases. So you've got these statements of principle and law and now you've got to put it in a form that makes sense to you. You can borrow some flowcharts. Michelle Sanson had a very good flowchart in her textbook and it was repeated on the back inside cover. So that's a flow chart that you might want to consider and adopt. Um, or you can create your own. There are other flow charts out there. When you're creating your first assessment piece and you'll be thinking about the way in which people want to interpret this legislation, what's the first thing that you expect someone who is reading the legislation to interpret it will do? And it sounds like a, a silly question, but it's, it's the first thing you've got to think about when you're drafting it. What would you do if you're trying to work out the, the interpretation of a statute? Sorry, John, do you mean, mm -hmm. sorry, do you mean trying to work out basic, um, what, what some of the words would actually mean? Because this is a yes. question because I've sometimes found that now that you can get caught up in some of the very basic words and it can become very confusing almost. Is that the type of question that you meant? Or? Look, it is. So yeah. if you're considering, for example, a section within an act and you're trying to work out what it means, you're trying to interpret it, the first thing I think you'd do is, and it sounds a bit trite, but you'd read it. So you'd read that section, but would you read it within the context of the entire act? I think you probably would. I mean, my process is if I'm reading a section in an act and I'm not entirely familiar with the act, I will read that section, but I will then as the next step, look at the entire act and get a feel for it. So I get a feel for how that section fits within it. Now, I guess in a sense, what I've done is create in my mind a little flowchart. That's what I do. Let's go back to then to the section or the words that you've read. You would think about the literal meaning and you'd ask yourself a question when you read it. Now, subconsciously or consciously, and what I'm trying to encourage you to do here is to actually think about your process when you're reading or trying to interpret. Do that within the context of the case law and the statutory provisions and then we're going to have to flip it because you're the one that'll be writing the material and you've got to think about what people will do. Greg says the chart in Sanson's book in the 2016 edition is page 270. Thanks, Greg. I think in the um, more recent, it's page 345 as well as the inside cover. Okay, so what I'm trying to do here is eventually work towards what it is that you need to do to write the material. But I'm asking you to consider this from the context of the reader. And for the moment, we'll assume that you're the reader. So I've said, if I'm interpreting a section, I read the section, number one. Number two, I look at the act entirely. I don't read it all, but I get a good feel for it. Once I then go back to the section and I read it, I'm going to ask myself this question. Is there a clear meaning? If I read this literally, is there a clear meaning? I'm going to ask myself that question. That's pretty Latin. That's pretty logical, isn't it? What if it's no? What if you say I, I'm not clear about this? It's ambiguous. To me, it's a, it's ambiguous. It's not clear. What's the next thing that you would do? And here's where we start to get a flow chart, don't we? Because we're getting a yes, no type situation. If it's not clear, what would you then do? You'd think about the context, wouldn't you? You'd think about what does this mean? Considering the context of the, the matter, what does it mean? You know, I think one an example I use in statutory interpretation and the basic thing is um, um, a provision that says um, uh, patrons are not allowed to take glasses into the um, 
into the licensed area of the, the, the football ground. Um, and does that mean spectacles? Does that mean glasses? No. We look at the context in determining that it must be some receptacle for drinking. Okay, so we read the section, we think about the literal interpretation. If it's not clear, if it's potentially ambiguous, we then think about the context, don't we? If, after considering that context, it's clear, we'll then consider the purpose of the statute. You know, why is this that we're doing the, um, this issue? And, um, you know, what, what is the purpose behind it? And then we're going to use either the contextual approach or the purposive approach in coming to a solution. Look, I won't take that any further, but I'm just going to leave that with you so that when you're reading legislation, when you're considering the case law and the sections, I want you to put it in a form that makes sense to you so that you can then think about that from the perspective of the end user in terms of what you are trying to achieve. I hope that makes some sense. It probably sounded clearer to me when I was mapping out what I was going to say tonight. Any questions about what I'm attempting to have you do? Do you have a clear idea of what I'm getting at? Or have I confused you? All good? All right. So you get the idea. We have all these different concepts. We have all these different sections, cases. It's a matter of putting it in order. What I don't want is to have you leave this unit feeling that it's all a bit of a jumble. I want you to have some clear focus, some clear ideas, so that at the end of the day, irrespective of your assessment, irrespective of your mark, you can walk away saying, I think I've got this statutory interpretation. It's a bit tricky. There are a lot of sections, there's a lot of different words that people use. In some ways, it seems that these words are used interchangeably, but I've mapped it out in a, in a way that makes sense to me. I've got an idea of what we mean by the contextual approach and when we use it. I've got an idea of the purposive approach and when we use it. Okay, so let's just not be in a position where we're rattling things off, um, but we're actually getting a good understanding, a good working understanding of how it's used. That's what I'm after. All right, um, so we know that the purpose of approach, Greg says all good, okay, so we can move on. Um, now, when you're drafting your material, make sure that you consider the Statutory Instruments Act of 1992. I think I may have covered this briefly last week. Did I, did I talk about the Statutory Instruments Act? Maybe not. All right, so have a look at the Statutory Instruments Act of 1992. And it's a bit interesting because in that act, you'll find that sometimes there are particular meanings which are prescribed to that section, um, which have a bearing on the, there's an interplay between the Act's Interpretation Act and that act. So the Statutory Inter Instruments Act of 1992 is Queensland legislation. And if you um, have access to Wastley or legislation Queensland, why not drag that up on the screen now and get an idea of it? I'll just give you a moment to do that. If you're watching this recorded session, please do that. Try and find your way to the Statutory Instruments Act of 1992. Just let me know when you found it and I'll move on. Getting there? All right, so the purpose of the Act Section 2, facilitate interpretation of statutory instruments, improve the presentation of instruments, rationalise notification, tabling and disallowing requirements of subordinate legislation, and ensure subordinate legislation is of the highest standard. The Act applies to all statutory instruments. And Section 6 provides for the meaning of statutory instruments. <clears throat> 
Section four talks about displacement by contrary intent. Now I mentioned note up earlier, and if you look at, and I think I, I've made some notes here for myself, but I think if you refer to section four, um, or possibly section six, you'll see in note up, I think, a reference to Bell and Townsend and others, 2014 QMC 30. This is one of the relatively rare reported magistrates court decisions. And it's an example of how this rather innocuous looking piece of legislation can actually draw some attention. In this case from a few years ago, we had a magistrate's court where three QCs, two other barristers were involved, instructed by four separate law firms. And there was a primary argument with respect to whether a certain complaint was valid or not because the complainant's appointment was inadequate and the appointment was a statutory instrument within the meaning of the Act. So this is an area where you need to just be aware of the potential importance of statutory instruments. Have a look at Section 7, which will give you an idea of what is a statutory instrument. Subsection 3 talks about it being um, a range of different pieces of subordinate legislation and um, that includes uh, regulations, local laws, bylaws, ordinances as well. The reason I mention that in um, particular is for, for you to consider in the context of your assessment piece and um, I know that you are looking at creating legislation rather than subordinate legislation but you need to know the difference and how you might use one against the other. Using note up, you'll see that there are a range of decisions that exemplify the broad nature that might be regarded of, uh, regarded about, about documents which are statutory instruments. So you'll see a decision of member trades in goldfield projects against Queensland Building and uh, Construction Commission, 2016 QCAT 362. And in that case, a merits review matter, the member had to make the correct and preferable decision. You'll recall that's what we do in merits review decisions. And it was um, a decision to review. Um, it was a case about reviewing a decision of the QBCC to issue a direction to rectify work. And the tribunal found that the rectification of building work policy, the rectification policy, um, which sets out when it may be unfair or unreasonable to issue a direction, is a statutory instrument and that must be applied by the tribunal in reaching its decision. So make sure that you're aware of the existence of the legislation and have some idea of how we use statutory instruments in practice and how they're generally um, referred to, considered. Okay, let's um, just digress for a moment. I just want to show you something that um, I hope this isn't embarrassing, Greg, but I'm just going to show something that you posted on Ucrew that I thought was excellent. And um, I'll just see if I can find it here. I'm sorry, John, that case yes. you just spoke about, was that, was that Claremont Holdings? No, no it was gold, gold, um, Goldfield Projects. Oh, gold. Goldfield. Okay, I'm looking at this thing. Okay, I'll find it. Thank you. Okay, uh, against QBCC 2016. Thanks, Helen. Okay, so you should see a post that, um, Greg, that's, that was the post you put up, wasn't it? And um, that was an excellent... Um, yes, John. Yep. So um, that's the sort of thing that we want to see in UCRU. And I thought it was an excellent example of the structure for statutes and legislative instruments set out in a way that um, uh, provides a lot of information in a readily accessible form. So please continue to do that. And if you haven't looked at UCREW, if you're watching this as a recorded session, please do so. Make sure that you share information and take advantage of the information which is being uh, provided by your colleagues because that's information that might just help you in terms of understanding process and ultimately drafting work for your assessment piece.
All right, Greg, did you want to make any comment about that or I'll keep going? Yeah, just keep going, John. That was good. Okay, thank you. thank you. All right, so we've talked about purpose or object. We know, I think, that uh, it's important to look at section 14A and 15AA of the Acts Interpretation Acts, Queensland and Commonwealth, respectively. So what we're trying to achieve here is um, interpreting so that we're best achieving the Acts purpose or object. However, um, how does that fit in with some case law? And when did this legislation come into effect? And how is it all tying together? Because when we're talking about looking at the context to determine the purpose or the, the object, isn't that really the, the sort of thing that we discussed in statutory interpretation when discussing the CIC insurance against Bankstown Football Club case? from 1997. So you need to be in a position where you can say, yes, this is a case that provides authority for this proposition. Here is a statute that provides authority or support for this proposition or this statement and tie them in together. So that if you're asked a question about the contextual approach, you may be able to refer to a case, refer to a quote, from that case and uh, tied in with the statutory provisions. I hope that makes sense and that's really going back to that first point that I made. So when it comes to dealing with extrinsic materials, which is part of the reading for week two, what are the important statutory provisions? So we've talked about the importance of considering the purpose of the legislation as far as statute and, and I've mentioned a case there as well, or a few cases, but when it comes to dealing with the use of extrinsic materials, what's the section in say the Commonwealth legislation that we need to consider? Yes, Helen's got it, 15AB, so thank you very much. So what we're saying there is that we may use extrinsic materials in two basic ways when attempting to use those materials for the interpretation of an act. It will either be to confirm a meaning as being the ordinary meaning or to determine the meaning if it's ambiguous or the ordinary meaning leads to a result that is manifestly absurd or unreasonable. Now, I'm gonna ask you this, this is a hard question um, to answer, but we're familiar with the modern approach, contextual approach, which is advanced by the case I just mentioned of CIC insurance against Bankstown Football Club, aren't we? I mean, just as a refresher, in that case, the court had to consider an insurance claim and the court looked at the mischief that the, mischief of the statute, which was section 58 of the, um, of the legislation, was intended to remedy. So right from the outset, even though there might have been a clear literal meaning associated with that section, the court felt it was appropriate from the outset to consider the context, didn't they? They looked then at the Law Reform Commission report, which provided a clear statement as to what this legislation was intended to do. It was intended to place, uh, to prevent a person from overlooking the expiry of a policy and prevent the insurer from not providing reasons for the non-renewal of that policy. Now, in that case, the policy had been cancelled, so it didn't matter. But that case is authority for the requirement, the modern approach, look at the context of any section, even though it appears to be clear on its face, look at the overall context. And in doing so, the court looked at extrinsic materials. Now, how does that fit within the reading of section 15AA? Because I have a problem with it. 
I'm not saying I'm not saying the High Court's wrong. Don't get me wrong, but I'm I'm just saying we need to. Each of us need to work out something that makes sense to us in terms of being able to rationalise the legislation and the statutory provisions. And part of this is because these provisions are coming in progressively, you need to be aware of when the provisions take effect and match them up with the case law because um, they, they may not be entirely, you know, one may come after the other, if you understand what I mean. All right, so bearing in mind what I've said about and what you recall about CIC insurance against B Bankstown Football Club, and looking at section 15AA, is there anything that comes to your mind as being slightly difficult to match from a, from a use perspective? Any thoughts? I know that's tough. Now bear in mind that section 15AB came into effect in 1984. So it was before the CIC insurance case. Here's what I think. If you look at section 15AB, do you have it there? Hopefully you've got it all in front of you. It says subject to subsection three, then you may consider extrinsic material to do one of two basic things. The first thing is, and this is part A, you can use the extrinsic material to confirm a meaning in a provision as being the ordinary meaning. So if you're unsure, look, that's what I think the ordinary meaning is. Let's have a look at the extrinsic material. Yes, the by reading the extrinsic material, I'm now satisfied that the ordinary meaning is confirmed as the appropriate meaning. But that's not a determination of the meaning, it's a confirmation as to what you thought the ordinary meaning was. Now let's look at subsection B of 15AB, because it says you can go to extrinsic materials to determine the meaning, but to determine the meaning only when it's ambiguous or obscure, or the ordinary meaning leads to a result that is manifestly absurd or unreasonable. So what that says to me is that if we're trying to do more than just confirm the ordinary meaning as being as the ordinary meaning, if we're actually trying, trying to determine the meaning, the threshold question is, is it ambiguous, obscure, or is there a manifestly absurd result? Because if there's not, I can't use the extrinsic material to determine its meaning. Anyway, that's some food for thought. Why is that relevant to your exercise? Because you'll need to overcome these sorts of um, issues when it comes to drafting your material. Excuse me, John. Can yes, I ask Greg? a question on that point? Yeah, sure. I just had a quick read of it. Is really what you're saying is that you're concerned that the judges in any interpretation have the ability to draw not only on what they know is the extrinsic material of an act, but if they wish, they can go outside of that act to draw inference. Is that your point? It is. Um, and to, to my mind, there's a little bit of inconsistency between 15AA and 15AB, because in 15AA, we're entitled to look at extrinsic materials in the whole context in order to obtain the, the purpose of the, the act. But in 15AB, it says you can use extrinsic materials, but in a more limited sense. Um, so I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not offering any answers or solutions here, but raising issues that I found difficult to understand. And to be honest, I'm looking for you to look at this with fresh eyes and give some thought to how it might be managed from a conceptual, conceptual perspective um, for each of you. Now, Tasman contributes, they can read what they think should have been there, they can read it in. 
Yes, I agree with that. Helen says the Alcan Illumina against Commissioner of Territory Revenue 2009 is mentioned in the textbook as a reminder that the task of statutory interpretation must begin with a consideration of the text itself, as per the uh, four High Court judges in that case. And that's a good point. That comes back to that very first question that I asked you tonight about what do you do when you read a section? Um, do, you, do you consider the text itself? So just try and map that out a bit more in terms of um, putting these sections together in a logical manner. But thank you for your thoughts in that regard. When it comes to section 15AB and the equivalent provisions in the state legislation, think about the underlying purpose or the object and think about confirming the ordinary meaning. Um, in other words, the extrinsic material can be taken into account in different ways if we look at that section. Another very good case to keep up your sleeve is Mills and Meeking. This is 1990. The High Court said if the language is clear and the purpose expressly stated in the Act, then there may not actually be any need to refer to extrinsic materials. Now, why do we need to refer to extrinsic materials at all? I guess the short answer is because that's what judges do. I'll give you a quote. This comes from a paper by um, Justice Hayden, um, which is presented um, extrajudicially. He says at page nine of his paper, talking about the enactment of Australian legislation, at it, at a, and he's talking about a symposium, at it, at the symposium, Justice Murphy said he habitually had recourse to Hansard and to committee reports. He went on, indeed, for legislation in the period 1972 to 75, if I wanted to know what it was all about, I'd go to state Senate Hansard and sometimes find a very clear statement of the legislative intent. The period of 1972 to 75 was, of course, the period in which the future Mr Justice Murphy had been leader of the government in the Senate and the Attorney General. Later in the symposium, Mr Justice Mason said, like Mr Justice Murphy, I often look at the second reading speeches. Unlike him, I do not confine my attention to those made by Senator Murphy. So it's interesting commentary in terms of how judges do in fact look at um, extrinsic materials. So if you're ever wondering whether you should, be aware of that that's what they do. Um, and also, of course, um, be aware of the obligation to um, fulfil plain English drafting requirements. Okay, um, so what do we, what can we take from tonight so far that you need to understand definitions, sections, have some case law, have some quotes, start to create a flow chart or some mechanism that works for you in trying to put these things together, identify and deal with any inconsistencies or issues where they don't seem to match well, uh, as I've identified one tonight, in, at least in my mind, and um, keep all of that in mind when you're starting to draft your material. Think about when you're drafting your material, issues to do with current meaning as opposed to the meaning at the time of the legislation. And just on that point, it's not clear cut. For example, in Coleman and Power, 2004, Justice Murphy talked about the living language of the law um, and the desire not to consider the subjective intention of parliamentarians years ago. But that wasn't necessarily um, a fully um, adopted by the High Court in that case. All right, so think about when you're drafting your material, coming back to the, the first assessment, some of the techniques, remember the technique of, of using a name or a word or a phrase to describe a longer word or phrase, typically say for, for an organisation. 
and make sure, and this is really important, that where a different word is used in the place of where a same word could have been used, the reader is entitled to believe that you meant a different meaning. Otherwise, you would have used the same word. So, I mean, if you're talking about a contract, for example, don't bounce between buyer and um, purchaser. Because if you do, you might think the same thing, but if you use different words, the reader will be thinking, well, buyer must mean something different to purchaser. So when you're drafting legislation, you need to be acutely aware of that. And if you make a change for something that would otherwise be the same thing, the reader is entitled to think that you meant there is a distinction between them. So just be really careful. Um, and I'll be watching for that carefully. When you're doing your drafting, think about limiting words um, and think about whether you should words, use words like solely, exclusively, only. Do they mean something different to primarily? Things of that nature. Also, if you're using technical words, make sure that you use the technical meaning or the trade meaning. I just want to show you something really interesting um, that I've come across, which I think is very useful. It's to do with the ATO, Australian Tax Office, and it's its legal database, um, including a thing called Interpretation Now. I'm just going to show you a snippet because I'm going to ask you, ask you to try and find this. And uh, I'll share the screen now to show you the excerpt of interpretation, which means statutory interpretation now. This is episode 35, published on the 27th of April this year. And you'll see that it is reference to information about statutory interpretation. Now, this is, as you might expect, within the context of revenue law primarily, uh, given that it's uh, promoted and uh, disseminated by the Australian Tax Office. But it does have interesting snippets of material that will assist you when it comes to dealing with statutory interpretation. So in that um, publication, in that uh, episode 35, you'll see that there's information there about um, court orders and um, other material. But in the earlier publication, the March publication, there's commentary about the difference between may and must and the way that trust deeds are construed in the same way as contracts. Um, a little earlier, um, November 2017, for example, there's some commentary about where an act requires a decision maker to be satisfied, and also some articles about the use of extrinsic materials showing intention, con with including consideration of examples given in an act. Now, that could be very useful for your first assessment to get some ideas and to get some authoritative, up-to-date commentary uh, as it applies in the tax revenue section. So I, didn't, I intentionally didn't show you the full ATO legal database, but if you want to get some brownie points in terms of participation, I'll leave you to find that and uh, potentially incorporate that into your material for your, um, if you like, your flowchart and uh, your toolkit. And just a reminder for those of you that didn't pick up on this last week, the importance of the Queensland Legislation Handbook, which I'm sharing there now, which is 60 pages set out by the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And you'll see some excellent material about the drafting process the parliamentary process, the development of a bill, information about subordinate legislation, we touched on that tonight, and some information about fundamental legislative principles. And as I mentioned last week, section 6.11 deals specifically with issues to do with explanatory notes and in, um, how you go about that process. All right, well, you've been really patient tonight. Um, thank you for your contributions during the week. Thank you for your attendance. And as I mentioned at the start, I do hope that you are now well on the way to identifying your area of practice that you believe is in need of redrafting. Before I sign off, are there any questions, comments? All good?
Okay. All right, we'll wrap up for this evening. We'll see you next week. All the best. Bye then.